I'd say we start with Peter, uh, Peter Casimir, of course, um, from your perspective as a central banker. What are you doing to help Slovakia deal with this crisis? This is a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> it's the deal question. with Slovakia. You know that I am the sitting in the governing <laughs> council of the governors of Central Bank, European mm. Central Bank. So it's a, it's a very delicate mission, you know. But uh, it was important that uh, just traveling back in, in time that Slovakia is the part of the eurozone, the part of the euro area. So it's the ones we are dealing with. Uh, on the euro area level, we also try to, to tackle the problem in Slovakia. So once, and, and th this is, I think, this is a universal, universal formula. Uh, it's not easy to believe, <laughs> I think, but it's, it's, uh, this is our, really our, our magic uh, sentence, the ma magic word it is. So, but what, what we did, you know, in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, precarious uh, time is that uh, it's that we make sure that there is enough liquidity in the system. That's the money, just to provide the banks, uh, households, uh, uh, corporate uh, business uh, with uh, cheap money. You know, the cheap funding is, is the most important part of, of of our role from the very beginning. That's what we. That you know, we did exactly that. We have uh, supported the recovery, and also to continue to to do so with the uh, with the so-called uh, toolbox which we we have in in um, um, in uh, our ammunition. And it's it's uh, it's quite. I think it's you aware that uh, we are dealing with accommodative monetary policy. We are losing this this policy. Then we provide uh, liquidity uh, with, uh, through the targeted liquidity operations against we, abbreviation like tilt rows, if you heard about that, LTROs or Opel trolls. These are the tools how to, how to deliver cheap money, uh, cheap funding uh, to the banks especially. And then, um, and this is the most important part of, of our business is, is uh, PEP. It, I think it's, it's very famous now. The PEP is emergency. APP or asset uh, uh, purchase uh, program, and we are we are just we are convinced about that that's very successful uh, because Sorry, I did the last bit I didn't get that what this is successful successful um, um, tool which which we are using because uh, it's, it's, this PEP is really huge. This is 1.3 billion um, uh, euros, and it's effectively helping. Uh, helping um, to lower borrowing costs and also to boost uh, lending in the Europe. Okay, so liquidity is uh, absolutely essential, of course, for, uh, for companies to be able to operate. Um, you mentioned asset purchases. Um, yeah. Of course, the, the interest rate is controlled by the European Central Bank, yeah. of which, of course, national banks feed into. Uh, that, even before the crisis, was already in negative territory, which is a, a remarkable thing to begin yeah. with. But uh, So we've, we've got those programs going on. Uh, what about from, so you know, presumably, you then connect very closely to the commercial banking sector. The commercial banking sector and the National Central Bank, of course, have to coordinate together with the European Central Bank in, in trying to produce measures. What, what is the perspective of a commercial banker in this situation? So you deal with corporations, companies that come to you, and you provide this liquidity in concrete terms. Um, what are you doing? Okay, maybe, first of all, I will start during the crisis, what we what was our first task? We, this was take care about our employees and clients because uh, you have to take in consideration we have to keep open our branches. The situation was not easy. People, people were, let's say, the nervosity was quite high, and we have to keep uh, the, let's say, the, the, the basic economy running. And uh, we saw the, the 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 activity also on on cash increased by 20%. This was our first task, and it was not easy at that time. Even at that time, we had 30 times lower rate of increase of COVID as we have now, and we, now we, we are open, nobody is dealing with this, and we are only taking care of the, the clients. Our clients and our employees are, let's say, 
reasonably uh, reasonably managed from COVID point of view. But if you ask me now, this was the step one, health, because this is health crisis. And then from liquidity point of view, I think uh, central banks as such, they, uh, they did very good job. I'm because, sure that's music too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't receive gift from Peter. I hope <laughs> after this uh, he will he will he will change his mind about commercial banks. Uh, and and uh, we saw in March April quite uh, decrease of interest on government bonds. Uh, usually in government bonds uh, we saw only domestic investors, not a lot international investors. And this support on, 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 on TLTRO quantito and especially quantitative easing, I think calmed down the whole market. It helps immediately in two, three months, uh, interest rates decrease by almost 1% in Slovakia. Slovakia is the country where interest rates on government bonds decrease the most in European Union, if, if I'm right, which helps to the government uh, refinance their needs at a lower level. And which then calm down also situation and financing of the of the corporates. And as a next step, we, we discussed with government about moratoria for retail clients, also for corporate clients. And last but not least, then government uh, guarantees for corporates, which, by the way, I expect it will be in much bigger amount as we see now. And as a, the most efficient uh, tool for, for, for clients, what I see now, these are moratoria for sure. Not only on the retail side, but also corporate side. Which means, I, I think the, 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 the quantitative reasoning helps, let's say, calm down this possible severe uh, crisis in real economy. And thanks to God, we manage also that this crisis was not moving to financial crisis. And in between, we discussed with our Minister of Finance on Bank Levy. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll get around to, the, to this coordination between yes. fiscal and, and monetary policy in a moment. Uh, I really think we, sh we need to bring in, uh, unless it's a very short comment you want to make. Um, uh, Just let me add what, what, Peter, uh, what Peter mentioned about, uh, about um, uh, spreads on, on sovereign debt, you know, so because it's true that uh, Slovakia was uh, uh, among the countries with the uh, worst impact on spreads on, on sovereign debt. On, on our bonds, you know, so in March. So they jumped up, you know, and then thanks to, thanks to PEP, thanks to this uh, pandemic, uh, uh, pandemic program, uh, the, the spreads uh, went down, so they dropped down. And that's easy, easily said, we can say that, that uh, we are the winners of the situation okay. in, the, in the Euro area. So All that's right. a good example, I think. Frau Tumpel-Gugler, uh, from a European central banking perspective, uh, which really has the, the big power, the big guns uh, to deal with this, in terms of l injecting link liquidity into the markets and assuring that, that the economy and the governments have enough to work with, uh, tell us what's, what's been going on there. What, what sort of dimensions are we talking about and what's new? I mean, first of all, you have to be aware that all the governors are deciding together on these measures. Yeah, you, you could, the ECB proposes, but all the governing council decides on this. And uh, an advantage of central bankers is that they can act very quickly and they don't have to ask anybody. They have a legal framework, they have a, a clear mandate, they are responsible to the public in, in Europe, but on the, we had a lockdown on the 13th of uh, March and on the 18th of March, five days later, the ECB announced a package of uh, 750 billion additional asset purchases. And I think this has to be kept uh, in mind that central banks can act very quickly. And there was, apart from the liquidity provision, there was a second step also uh, very important, namely the adjustment of supervisory rules. Yeah? The, the, the supervisor, the, the central banks have helped the banks to go through this crisis. Because this crisis is, of course, a burden for the capital. And of course, it is now uh, maybe supported, banking sector is supported by public guarantees. But we have to be aware that we have many companies which face serious difficulties. 
we see more and more shops are closing, restaurants are closing, and this is a challenge. Yeah? It's a challenge also for the banking sector. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a massive challenge uh, because in a situation, I mean, normally a central bank would adjust its interest rates perhaps mm -hmm. as having one level, and you talked about the responsibilities of a central bank, the, those responsibilities, if I understand them correctly, concern financial stability, price stability, and assuring liquidity mm -hmm. in, the, in, in markets, of course, but the, the and, you know, financing government debt, whatever. But the, in this particular crisis, you've had, it is, it's my understanding that unprecedented steps are being taken, particularly when it comes to asset purchases. Uh, uh, asset purchases, I mean, and massive purchases of government bonds, of corporate you know, bonds too, some assets, most of them good, but maybe not all of them good. You talked about loosening regulation. I'm very interested to hear about that because we had a, heard a previous banker today talking about the three big challenges in the banking sector, and those challenges including regulation right up there, you know, the digitization, of course, uh, being an issue as well, but uh, regulation, how is regulation being affected in this? I mean, after the financial crisis of 2008, uh, regulation was tightened. Yeah? In the, before the crisis, banks had low levels of capital, de facto very low levels of capital. So since then, capital has been doubled. Uh, and a lot of, of uh, non-performing loans have, have to be, had to be digested. Uh, so regulation was tightened, and this has helped the banks in the current crisis also to be resilient and make people aware that they are a very important pillar for stability in this crisis, yeah? and they remain so. So people are more aware that banks this time didn't face the crisis themselves. It's more the real sector, it's the health sector, but not the banking sector. And uh, regulation, of course, there are sometimes complaints that it's too too detailed, there are too many requirements, but at the moment there's the time to decide uh, how do you use buffers which are in the system, which you can use in times of a, of a deep recession. This is a kind of, of uh, fine tuning uh, of regulation at the moment. So there's no time for a general uh, overhaul, but the main, main import, uh, important question to me is uh, how to revive the economy what can be done to, to support confidence, uh, to support growth, and also how do we get back to inflation rates, which are the medium-term orientation uh, of 2%. Uh? Mm -hmm. And it's not so easy. Uh? If, you, if you ask a student of economics today what he or she would find in their textbooks about the current situation, you wouldn't find anything. Yeah? So we have to design everything new, it has to be developed, and at some point it has also to become a kind of rule, because people want also to have an orientation, want to have understand why the central bank is acting in a certain way. There's no game plan for this, is there? This is, this is learning by doing. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the message that was coming from the European Central Bank and other central banks around the world as, as well, the, the, the Fed the, in Japan as well, the, the message is, you know, we'll do whatever it takes. There's like, there's, there's liquidity enough. Don't worry, we'll do whatever we have to and we'll take unprecedented steps to assure that that's there. Do you, are you confident that the steps that are being taken, and I'll ask Peter Kazimir first, uh, also from your perspective as... Uh, just, uh, just is it, also, is it, but are you taking the right steps? Uh, Do you have that confidence? Just to, uh, on, on regulation also, just to mention that, you know, we have to guard the financial stability. I think this is the, it's, it's pretty important role which uh, the central banks uh, have in, in, uh, in, in the member states. And uh, in, in, in our Slovak case, for example, the capital adequacy of, of Slovak commercial banks is double now if we compare with 2009. It's, it's really the same, which has been mentioned already. And I think it, this, it's the crucial difference if you compare the crisis in 2009 and now. It's, it's a really different one. But in 2009, the, the, the financial sector was the source of the problems. Hmm. And now the, the, uh, the financial sector together with central banks uh, are the, the, um, the part of solution, you know, and we can provide this, this assistance and this, this, this help, you know, in the system. You know. So this difference is, is, is here. So 
do you feel that the coordination then between uh, the central banks, I mean, between the various aspects of the banking sector itself, that's all seems to be working smoothly. This is the message I'm getting from the three. Okay, we've got, we've got a mm, kind of a head shaking over there. Uh, would you like to, to comment a little further? Yeah, look, now I will, I will comment this from point of view of a uh, banker being in Euro country. In other words, in country where you have for a long time low interest rates, in these days still below zero. In other words, the whole business model in banking sector in Europe is based that you, you are earning almost nothing on deposits and you can earn money on fees and, uh, and loans, yes? And you have quite, and, and we had before COVID, very low risk costs. And now the whole situation changed, as you said, Nobody knows what will happen in uh, next month, in six, in six months. And you have banks uh, with uh, very low margins, generally through the Europe, uh, and the same, the same is valid also for Slovakia, and big uncertain, uncertainty on, on risk uh, profile in, in the next months, years, uh, better say in next year, because uh, the, the, the whole morat moratoria change the, uh, we, d we don't know what, what's the quality of our clients due to the moratoria. We will know next year when moratoria will end. And then we will start to see if the risk profile of client on the retail side of corporate client is worsening, of course will worsening, and, but how much is worsening. And therefore, therefore it's, 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 very, it's, very, it's very important for us now prepare for this time. It's not easy because figures looks very fine. And at the same time, uh, I, uh, if, if you look on central bank, and therefore I said, I'm not totally sure, and I will, and now I think from a point of view of a uh, commercial banker, you know, you have two types of possibilities how central bank is acting towards to the commercial bank in, in, in from this point of view as we are discussing. And these are macro prudential uh, policy, policy yeah. and the interest rates. Central bank is now dealing mainly with macroprudential policies, not with uh, interest rates. And usually is dealing in the way it's against of interest of commercial bank from profitability point of view. And maybe this is one of the reasons why if you look on Bloomberg and you will see average valuation of European bank, you will see 50%. Because the business model is very, very much dependent on, on, uh, on, on, on decision of regulator. Mm. And usually it's taken in consideration that we have to slow down uh, the, we have to slow down the, the, let's say the loan, loan distribution, but we are doing this not through interest rates, but usually through macro prudential policy. You, commercial banks, uh, in, but in the commercial banking sector, these are you're profit oriented, right? I mean, it, you, you have a purpose, of course, to serve society and, and whatnot, but uh, you also need to remain profitable. Yeah. Is that possible in this environment? Yes, of course. You, you, feel, you feel good about that? No, so I don't feel good, but it's possible. You ask me if I feel <laughs> if it's possible, not so if I feel things. good. You're absolutely right. These are, these are two different right. questions. Possible and, and feeling good, very two, two different things. So possible, how about, can you move to probable with that? Do you think mm -hmm. it's, uh, do you s see yourself uh, sustaining profitability moving forward? Does this create new challenges for you in the, in the commercial banking sector? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the first part of your question. Yeah, does I, this situation that we're facing yes? now, create challenges for the commercial okay. banking sector that would compromise your ability to remain profitable moving forward? Yes, of course. Okay. And, um, and as I, I said, there, I is, there, is one, there is one element and this is provisions and current pricing. And second element is, as, 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 as we discussed, uh, the, the, the future uh, inflation, interest rates development, and at the same time macro prudential policy and, and all these things. Very complex matters. And but long story short, long story short, we have to really focus and banking sector is focusing mm. on fee income. This is, I think, the okay. which in Europe generally is very low in Slovakia particularly. 
this is a kind of a whole separate discussion we can have about whether you know, the commercial banking sector, retail banking sector is going to remain profitable moving forwards, also for investment banks, how, the, how all this is shaping that. We don't, we're not going to talk too much about that because we want to get into the relationship between fiscal policy and monetary policy, these two policy domains, what this crisis is doing with that. And I would put this question to someone with, uh, you know, of course, you're not the only one on this panel who has experience working with the European Central Bank, but from this larger perspective, what is the role of a central bank? Is the role of a central bank changing through this crisis? Or is, it, yeah, perhaps you can talk about that. I think we have to think of the last three crises maybe to understand what is happening. In 2010, uh, the central banks had a very detailed framework of how they could uh, act and they didn't need a, a single new law to, to fight the crisis. But there was no framework for fighting the crisis from the side of governments. And this was the problem. So this was in a situation where in May 2010 it was unclear whether governments would agree on a, on a rescue network for Greece. And in this situation, uh, the uh, central bank started to buy government bonds, also to calm the market. But in the, in the long run, it's not the role of the central bank to stabilize uh, debt markets for governments. Uh, it's clearly not. And therefore, it's so important to have the ESM. Yeah? The ESM it was really a big step forward. It's a clear framework. And in the end, also the recovery fund. The yeah? stability the, mechanism. Yeah. And it's a, well, since we're here, I want to open the floor in just a moment, but since we're at that point talking about that, uh, do you think that the stability mechanism rules, the 3% limit, for example, th are these going to be softened in this context? Do you see changes coming through on that? I mean, in the, in the end, you need a framework how the, how the expectations are that other countries who are sovereign in their fiscal policy should behave because otherwise they, they, you, you cannot keep the system together. So you need a, an agreement, maybe in a changed environment, but you need a, a common understanding what are the expectations. In the end, it's only possible to a limited extent to influence countries from outside. Yeah? If, if a country has to reform uh, and, and undertake changes, it has to do it itself. You cannot, from Brussels, you cannot modernize a country from far away. Yeah? In the end, countries have to take the responsibility. Because sooner or later, I mean, it's not, it's no, not only that it's maybe one day difficult again to finance uh, government debt, but also in the end, you don't get investors, you don't get innovation, you don't get young people who are qualified move away. Yeah? These are, there are many consequences of this. And therefore, sound policies require uh, an internal design. Yeah? We, I would love to open the floor up here uh, because I know that there are a lot of people working, you know, connected to this sector that are affected by these policies that we're discussing here. We have about 18 minutes left. If you have a question, just raise your hand. And uh, I'm hoping that, yes, we have these boom mics coming around. Uh, Again, don't, you don't need to touch the mics. They'll just hang it right there in, in front of your face and, and go. So if you have a question, please just raise your hand, and I'll, I'll try to collect a couple of them um, as we go along. But uh, yeah, I'm also, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> OK. On this fiscal policy, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is an inevitable part of, of the policy makes response, you know. So, so it's, the complementary principle is important. You know, that's, uh, it's like uh, you are sitting in the boat for, for two, you know, skull, is double yeah, skull. skull, yeah, double well, skull. Yeah. You are, and, and one is rowing, one is rowing, and uh, the another one, uh, not so much. You know, this, <laughs> this is the present situation, you know. So, of course, uh, you can sit, you can meditate, uh, the smoke, the cigar, because uh, another sculler uh, is rowing. And uh, at the end, you... Of course, you will, you will, you will reach uh, uh, your destination, but it would, it would get uh, uh, there much faster, much faster um, uh, with both moving equally fast. You know, so so the, the fiscal policy is in, in this situation is an inevitable part of of, uh, of policy mix, and uh, the problem is also you know it's uh, it's uh, that uh, the architecture of monetary union. Is, is, is not finished yet, you know. So the completion, if you probably you heard about the uh, banking union 
about the um, capital market union. So, so all these uh, pillars, you know, are pretty important. But also the fiscal union, which used to be taboo word in in many <laughs> countries. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I think it must be on, on the radar. Uh, I remember, because I, you mentioned, I, I was longest, very long time serving as a finance minister. You know, I remember years and years <laughs> of discussions on, on, on fiscal action, on common, you know, collective action in this area. Uh, it's pity that Bruno Le Maire is not with us today, but he's a big fighter, you know, for uh, for for Euro budget, for example, you know, which has to be uh, changed to the budgetary instrument because of uh, stabilization faction of of, uh, of of Eurozone budget is taboo in many countries. Good. We do have one question. Uh, bringing the audience at this point uh, there at the back. Going back on something very important that was mentioned that... Uh, Sorry, I didn't catch your name and who you represent. Sorry, uh, Svetoslava Georgieva. I'm from the Ministry of Finance uh, in Bulgaria. Thank you. Um, going back on the important point that actually the quality of the portfolios of banks will become clear only after moratoriums are over. Um, what are your thoughts on one year from now? What if provisions start rising and we see again non-performing loans rising quickly? How can we use um, what we already have as investment packages today to counteract rising NPOs in a year from now when we actually know what's going to happen uh, after moratoriums are over? Uh, of course, uh, banks have learn okay. some lessons and have capital ratios, but what are your thoughts on what can be done already now to prevent this a uh, year from now? Thank you. Well, I, I presume that's kind of what the strategy must be, but um, perhaps one of you can go into more detail on that, ideas about that, thoughts? Maybe, okay, I will start. Okay, you have chance then. No, <laughs> no. look. What, what you can do? Uh, no, we we are doing our let's say independent analysis. How what's the quality of the portfolio? And I have to say, we are discussing also with central bank. And uh, thanks to God, it looks it's not as bad as we expected. For example, March, April. I'm not saying we will have such optimistic let's say mood in uh, in six months from now. This nobody knows. And therefore, you have to be very careful how this year you will manage creation of uh, your provisions for, for end of the year, even uh, there is not so many cases, let's say, in, um, in, uh, in NPLs. This is, this is point one. Point two, it's for sure, I'm saying the, the COVID is the best chief digital officer in the last five years. And uh, it helps you see what's important for the bank and what not. In other words, cost optimization of the bank to prepare bank for, for next year's because for sure income or increase of income will be limited and my working assumption is you can increase your revenues mainly on, on fees. Okay. And Sorry. Go ahead, you have another point. Okay, this is enough. Okay, yeah, so again, to you wanted I, to. I think in a year from now, you will, we will be in need of restructuring capacity uh, to help uh, firms to overcome uh, the, the situation. I mean, there will be companies who, who have no business model anymore, but there will be companies where there is maybe with some additional capital, uh, which cannot come from the banks, uh, some risk capital, sometimes from the state, sometimes from other investors, they, th these investors should help to f for some companies to, to find a new, new life and a new role. Yeah? It is possible, but you have to intervene early enough. Yeah? Once you are close to insolvency, then, then it's too late. Yeah? If I can, I, I think we, we just now we have to focus on downside, downside risk uh, scenario reflecting raising second wave hmm. pandemic. Um, what I see that uh, the, the net profit of, of commercial banks this year will be higher than next year. 
What we okay. see and what we do recommend is uh, to just to be responsible, especially in, in provisions policy. We see the differential, you know, a lot of difference you know, among the groups and the houses in, in, in the banks. And uh, uh, also we just, uh, we, we launched, we tried to help with this, uh, with data, lack of, lack of data, which is uh, caused by this moratoria. Uh, we launch uh, this special project. Uh, this is a, a project focusing on, on, on households in which uh, financial uh, situation of Slovak households are, and we try to provide it with this information also commercial banks. So, and also we are ready to accommodate our, our macroprudential policy, you know, because this policy toolkit is in our hands on national level. Uh, maybe, okay. maybe only one comment and very responsive. Yeah, very short, if you can. Capital planning. That's, I think, I didn't mention, which is very important. And Capital what? Capital planning. Capital planning. Okay. The European Recovery Fund, 750 billion euros. A big chunk of that is to be distributed as grants. Uh, this is the European Union, I mean, no, not, the, not the central bank. This is the this is the fisc this is fiscal policy, basically stimulus. Yep. I mean, it has to do with you. But what do you make of that part of the recovery fund that is being distributed in grants? What it, not what impact is that going to have? But what effect is that going to have on the discipline, perhaps, of the countries that receive it and the way it's going to be? Dis the way it's are, how do you feel about the way that's going to be distributed? Your thoughts on that as bankers. For me, uh, the, this recovery plan, so-called recovery plan, it's, it's uh, finally, this is a seed of, of uh, fiscal capacity. This is, you know, something which can really influence this never-ending discussion about the fiscal union in, 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 in the Eurozone. And it's, it's again, I'm, I'm, I think, I'm pretty sure that I'm convinced about that, that we suffer from incompletion of, of architecture and fiscal capacity is something which is missing now. So, in the reality, uh, it's uh, conditional, you know, so there's a part of, of reforms, you know, this is the way how to, to make it, I mean, our economy is more resilient, more innovative, more in, in, innovative, like we have seen just with these batteries and with others. There's a long, long list of, of uh, weaknesses, you know, in, 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 in our countries. And is, is this a, a strange and role? And we have to just to tackle this, these weaknesses. I mean, you know, this is, for, as I understand, it's the first time that this has ever been done. This, uh, this is not going to add to a country's national debt. This, there's no real clear idea about how it's going to be repaid, is there? Is there, there is, please go ahead. No, but I mean, there is, for a grant, there is no repayment. And we right. have we have. But it comes from somewhere, right? Yeah, but but yeah, yeah. But if, if if it is said in advance that they don't have to to repay, it's even more help. Yeah. And so uh, how, so will taxes be imposed to? But all the countries will contribute to the repayment yeah. in the end. This is important to keep in mind. Yeah. And therefore, it's important to, to use the money carefully because the next generation will repay this additional debt. And Fiscal I, union, yeah. I was very relieved when I saw an agreement on the 21st of July because there was this call for fiscal capacity for many years. But now, of course, it's very important to, to use the money wisely yeah? and, and that it doesn't take too long to, to really also do, to, to invest it. Yeah? You know, many great leaps are made during crises, right? We're in a, in a tremendous leap here. With the architecture of the European Union, many said it was flawed from the very beginning because you are pushing monetary policy, which was partly a consequence of, of German reunification and the deals that were done around that. But having monetary union without fiscal union, hmm, that for many feel, felt like a bit of a contradiction. Do you see what is happening now in this crisis pushing the European Union towards a fiscal union? I mean, we are far away from a fiscal union, yeah? We have a budget, an EU budget, which is around 1% of GDP. Right. So compared to the size of the EU, is still a limited amount, which is EU budget. 
and also even the recovery fund, which is a big amount yeah, in absolute terms, in view of the size of the economy, is still an add-on, but is not changing the, the composition of that. The majority of the funds are, are raised with taxes at the national level and are spent at the national level. So it's not yet a, a fiscal union, which I don't see for the foreseeable future, but what you need is what we have seen during the crisis. You need stabilization mechanisms and you need balancing mechanisms. There is because a lot of in the end, the recovery fund has also some similarity to the structural and cohesion funds, because they are also a kind of redistribution between countries which have lower uh, GDPs uh, and those who have higher levels. Sure. Yeah? Sure, that, that makes sense. The, um, with, with the recovery fund, particularly with these grants, I mean, there was a lot of discussion about euro bonds and, uh, you know, I live in Germany and of course the, you know, there was a certain yeah. al allergy to that uh, in, in, the, in the Bundestag. Uh, but anyway, Peter, you but want to comment? <laughs> just, I'm not a politician anymore, so I can be blunt a little bit <laughs> on that, you know, so. Uh, no, I, I, I see that, that it is the step towards to the, to the future possible fiscal Union, and in my view, this is a right appropriate uh, step. Um, of course, channel to the responsibility, channel to the to fiscal uh, responsibility in all countries, to the fiscal the national fiscal frameworks also. So, and of course, as you are right, this is not free lunch, you know. There is no free lunch, yeah, no okay. true words. Peter, I think you want to, to intervene there, no? Um, what are, go ahead, you, sure, please. Maybe we should just uh, explain what is the difference between a euro bond and what we have now. Well, collectivization yeah. of debt we're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. No, that, that's, that's clear, but it, when there's no clear terms on how the debt is going to be repaid, yeah, it, you no, know. No, but it, it will be according, according to, to um, uh, capital key, yeah? The repayment is clear, because okay. the repayment, as, at least as I understand it, repayment is as contribution to the, to the EU budget, similar. So you think that will come out of the normal you know, multi-year framework, yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah. financial uh, framework? Only That's it, interesting, it would I wasn't aware. not be the case if there is an extra tax. Yeah? If okay. there is an agreement on a I've new tax, Things to the contrary. Yeah. Member countries would not have to, to repeat. Okay. I'm, I'm a little curious in, in this situation where we see the approach of central banks changing in this crisis, uh, making unprecedented steps, particularly when it comes to asset purchases, uh, you know, massive asset purchases, but also the way you know, they're intervening in the bond market in, in different ways. Whether the, in, in coordination with federal governments and different governments, whether we're seeing an erosion of the independence of central banks. Uh, I would like to invite each of you during our last three and a half minutes to comment on that. <laughs> I see nods <laughs> and <laughs> no. so I think we've I touched mean, on it. I, this, no, I think we're getting to the, a good I part mean, now. I mean, it always, I mean, you always have a combination. What is the legal framework? And this is very clear. So the, the, the central banks could act in the crisis. Of course, they were talking to, to politics and to government, but they had to take their own responsibility. So they are, they can act independently. This is the idea. And, but if you have a deep recession, central bank cannot and should not say, it's not my business, I stick to the, to the interest rates, sure. yeah? And in each crisis, what we have seen also in the past, we have not seen so deep re recessions as we see right now, but also in the past, central banks, as long as they could see that this doesn't create inflation, they were lowering interest rates and in this sense also helping to come out of the crisis. This is what happens now as well. I think that such kind of thoughts are coming from, from low for long uh, environment, you know, and, and I think it's, uh, and what's a, uh, real threat is that it's, yes, you're right, that unreasonably mm, long accumulative monetary policy could cause certain side effects. Uh, for example, uh, we can provide wrong uh, incentives for politicians. I mean, this, <laughs> this, I mean, I mean, this skull, scholars, you know, sitting and, and meditating. Absolutely. Or we can also can 
generate uh, you know wrong expectations or they anchor these expectations or even even we can lead uh, with such kind of policy to the fiscal dominance but what's what's important that we have to be aware of such kind of risk and we have to prevent it Peter Kluti, a quick comment, then we're going to bring in a question yeah. from the front row. I will, I will only yep. comment very quickly from my commercial banker point of view. As at the moment, uh, the central banks are focusing not only on inflation target, they are focusing also on some other targets. This is clear for me. question how long they will keep this strategy. If this will be short-term strategy or middle-term or long-term strategy, this is point one. Point two, as we are talking here about this amount of bonds, Central and due to the fact the central banks at the moment, I think central banks has uh, something like 30 percent of government bonds of Europe, yes? yep. this, like something like this, which, in other words, they, they they will be they will be very dependent on the quality of these bonds. And for me, for me, it will be very interesting to see. Hopefully, once we we will see high inflation, high cost for refinancing of the government, which can have impact on. Uh, on quality of the portfolio, which is even in, in portfolio of central bank. And these all things are, I think, a little bit making life not so independent in central banks. That's uh, a welcome observation. Uh, we have a question in the front row. My name is Elena Kohutiko. I'm a member of the Supervisory Board of uh, Commercial Bank of Eu Banka. Uh, the role of central bank is changing. Uh, now there is a huge amount of money, as was mentioned, available for the countries. This money has to be used uh, not just for recovery of the countries, but also for supporting the stability of the common currency. Uh, where do you see the role of central bank in this uh, creation of this recovery plan and of implementation? Do you think the central bank have some roles in this because it is a uh, the common economic uh, development, or the central bank have to keep the independence in this process. Thank you very much. Who would like to begin? Perhaps here. What was the first part of the question? I didn't hear it. Uh, was it the? Uh, the is yeah. And uh, now there is a volume of money is available for um, reform in, uh, yeah. in our countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, since the central bank uh, were independent, uh, this is a uh, fiscal money, or which is coming to the government. Which role mm -hmm. the central bank mm -hmm. has yeah. to play by preparing and by implementing yeah. this? Uh, Thank you. No, I mean the central banks are involved in, let's say, monitoring the economic programs of the countries in the European committees and and bodies, but they shouldn't have a. A, a view on the policy. When they are asked as, uh, for advice, I think they should give it. But they should not steer, which, I mean, I, I started central bank in a time when we decided, yeah, when we decided which sector should get the loans and which not. Uh, and this, this would not be done by the central bank nowadays. Yeah. I just okay. can, I just These are your last words, by the way. So <laughs> <I just can't, laughs> we're going to have to wrap I it up here. I just can repeat what we, what we uh, announced last week on, on that issue. Because we announced publicly that all five priorities in the recovery yeah. plan, so based on our analytical capacity, yeah. just recommendation, nothing yeah, more. Exactly. Yeah. Peter Klug, do you? I think I'm from commercial bank, and this is something <laughs> I, I cannot comment due to the fact that you know. The supervision is sitting next fair to enough, Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> on Friday afternoon. And I'm, I'm trying to keep my independent position. On <laughs> the, on the <laughs> very good. So we have a, have a very clear division of labor here. I uh, uh, really appreciate all three of you providing your individual and very experienced perspectives on this. I learned a lot. The, the sound here makes it a little difficult to, un to understand what people are saying, but I hope that everyone in the audience was able to, to hear what we had to say. Um, I think we're all eager to have a coffee and it is time for a coffee break. So thank you very much. Just a round of applause for our wonderful guests. Thank you very much.